I'm the entomologist for the department. Uh, Curtis Irwin uh, is my assistant. He's been working for me for about 15 years. And we oversee a lot of things in the entomology department or division section. Um, and invasive insect surveys is just one of those. Uh, and, but a very, very important one. It's, it's where we're trying to keep things uh, out of the state. Uh, some of the other programs we oversee, uh, the Mormon Cricket Program, uh, insect uh, identification, uh, the reference collection of insects for the state is part of our duties. Um, uh, West Nile virus survey for an outline area also falls into that thing. But today we're going to talk about invasive insects. So what is an invasive species? And Andrea Mo may have talked a little bit about this uh, in her lecture. Um, they're non-native. Uh, many times I hear the media and other places talking about invasive species. Uh, biologically, in, in the biological world, uh, they, they're non-native. Uh, native species aren't invasive. They may be pest species, but they're not necessarily invasive. Um, they cause some sort of damage. It can be environmental, it can be crop, or it can be just a nuisance. We do have species that don't cause us any uh, crop or uh, you know, damage to plants or anything or to people, but they are, uh, they do replace native insects uh, in the environment. So uh, that can be a big problem. They all usually show a wide adaptability uh, for the environment and for the hosts. In other words, uh, they can survive a, across a wide uh, breadth of, of biomes and, and uh, have the ability to to feed on a number of hosts. And the big thing is they're introduced without natural enemies. Uh, and as we'll see in a second, that's how they, they uh, uh, expand. What do we do uh, for them? We look at pathways. Pathways are the way that these insects are being brought in uh, to, to Nevada or to the United States. Uh, the big one is, get it before it gets here, uh, treatment inspection of goods uh, before shipping, then uh, inspection and rejection. Uh, sometimes treatment is available at destination. In other words, if we find it, if it's contained and we have materials to, to uh, eradicate it from the material that's coming in on, uh, that can sometimes be done. Uh, if it gets out of that pathway, um, Early detection is extremely important, and that's really where our trapping and survey uh, program comes into to, uh, play. Education is becoming a bigger and bigger deal. Uh, we look to uh, citizen science uh, and citizens to look and say, hey, I don't know what that is. I want to get it identified. It might be something bad. Um, there's been a number of these things. If people had done that, we probably could have stopped them or at least slowed them dra down drastically. Um, and we as, as government, and that goes not just for uh, the state of Nevada, but for other states and for uh, the federal government that's involved with this, um, we just don't have enough bodies uh, to be able to cover the entire areas uh, that really need to be covered. If we do find a um, infestation, uh, we go into the eradication mode. And uh, basically first we deliminate the population, uh, see how far it's spread, uh, see if there's anything uh, that can be done uh, about it. And if there is, then we go into the eradication mode. And this is another term that gets used, misused a lot I think, um, in the pest control uh, realm, uh, people talk about eradicating something. Well, when you eradicate something, it's gone. You're not going to have to come back and treat it uh, normally. Uh, versus control, which control is what we do with the ants in our yard. Uh, that's control. That's not eradication. Um, you know, we're looking... And we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, the smaller the area, the quicker, earlier we detect it, 
the more successful we are with eradication. And we've had several uh, successful ones, and we'll mention a couple of those as we go along. Long term, if it gets out of hand, uh, it starts moving uh, to the point where eradication is no longer an option. Then we go back to the looking at natural enemies and, and natural controls uh, wherever the insect came from and, and try and introduce those. Much like, uh, I don't know if Andrea talked about biocontrol of weeds, same, same deal. Uh, the weed gets to the point where we can it longer, no longer control it chemically or culturally. Uh, then we look for insects and pathogens to control them. Uh, same, same thing with insects. So our uh, trap and inspection surveys, um, we uh, put out about 3,000, do about 3,000 inspections and, and or traps uh, per year. Uh, this is a list of the, some of the surveys that we have. We probably look for a total of maybe uh, 20 species. Um, you know, a number of these things have uh, more than one species that we're looking for. Um, exotic wood borer, uh, we have nine species that are the primary ones, but we found a number of different things uh, as we go along. Uh, but all these contain species that if they got established in Northern Nevada or Southern Nevada, uh, would cause us problem. Our honeybee uh, survey, it sounds a little weird to say it's an invasive species survey, but we're not surveying for honeybees, we're surveying for the pests and diseases uh, that affect the honeybees. And we do a relatively small amount, but we try and spread that out across the state. One of the ones that uh, invasive species that has gotten brought in is a brown marmorated stink bug. That's this one over here. It can be recognized primarily by these little white bands on the antennae and the, the, the edge of the, what we call pronotum or shoulder, if you will, of the insect is smooth. Uh, this one was introduced in the eastern United States and basically spread uh, westward. Um, and as it spreads, you can sort of see the gradation uh, from red, which is uh, a severe problem, to orange, uh, to yellow, to green. And if you looked at some of these uh, orange and red states out west here, uh, just a year or two ago, uh, they would have been blank or green um, uh, just, just a few years ago. This thing uh, is, is well established now on the West Coast. Big problem back here, uh, both from a crop standpoint uh, and from a, a, actually a household nuisance. They like to hibernate in homes. But how are they getting across? Well, that's the whole pathway thing. Um, in, in this case, it's basically shipping materials. Uh, we have gotten to the point in the world where, and in the United States, where things are moved, uh, if not within hours or days, within a week. It goes from being uh, in its, its native area or in a, an infested area to an uninfested area very rapidly. And if you can think about, uh, it's, it's really been in the news lately, the whole uh, shortage uh, of materials, uh, and you can you get to see all the ships off of the, the port of Los Angeles or uh, port of Long Beach. You think about all those containers that are coming in, those are all part of the pathway that these insects are being brought, either just physically in the container or in the material in the container or in the material that's uh, the shipping material that's, that's uh, being used to ship the material, uh, the, the commodity, like, like pallets and things like that. This is a relatively new one uh, that's cropped up in the eastern United States. Uh, we're really looking for it uh, to be moved uh, further west. Uh, this is the blue area is where its infestation is now, and you can start seeing all these little satellite things. And actually, you can't see it on uh, a very interesting thing came up. And this falls in with the citizen science thing, why we encourage people to bring in things in that they don't know. Um, in Kansas, I believe it was, 
Uh, they were judging entomology collections at the state fair, and lo and behold, uh, there was a spotted lanternfly uh, in the uh, collection. And, and now, uh, of course, we're going back, um, the Kansas Department of Ag and the Plant Protection and Quarantine section of USDA is trying to go back and find out, well, I, the, 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 the kid apparently collected it on his porch. So how did it get there? And that's, that's the important thing to figure out. And are there any more out there, that, the delimiting surveys that we talk about? Gypsy moth is one that's been around in the United States for a number of years. Um, it was intentionally introduced, and it's kind of weird because the way this works, all these states are infested. Uh, this insect defoliates a couple million acres of trees a year. Uh, it was intentionally introduced actually by a researcher back in the late 1800s thinking he was gonna uh, create a silk industry in the United States, but it's moves out we put out two or 300 traps a year uh, for it. You can see there's, there's some little um, infestations around out here. And actually we caught one uh, in Nevada and we'll be uh, delimited, doing the delimiting survey this next spring uh, and figuring out. Yeah, you often catch a lot of singles because these, uh, again, are transportation system, but a lot of these uh, infestations are actually through uh, the movement of either uh, goods from people moving from the East Coast to the West Coast or camping material, RVs, uh, trailers, things like that. And uh, so you often do get single ones um, uh, popping up in, in remote areas. This is why we don't want it. Um, there's uh, two varieties. Um, one, if I can go back, one variety uh, is the American or European uh, variety. That's this one. And the females, although they're winged, they don't fly. Uh, the Asian gypsy moth, uh, the females fly and present a huge risk. Uh, if the females can fly, you're gonna get a lot quicker establishment and spread. Uh, to try and control. These are just some of our Asian defoliators. I mean, like, like the uh, spotted lanternfly, some of these insects are actually really, really kind of gorgeous insects as far as the uh, uh, colorations go and everything. But these are ones that are on the hot list, so to speak. Uh, we look at what's going on in the world and in other parts of the world as far as pests are concerned. and um, Basically, that's the ones we target. Uh, most of these, uh, let me look, going back. Most of these, uh, we try and use pheromones on, uh, especially sex pheromones. These are this little green trap, um, contains a little lure inside of it. It's a sex pheromone that the males can actually smell about a quarter mile away. Um, so, uh, you know, we can put these out and we, we tend to focus on moving areas, campgrounds, high um, areas with high traffic of, of people coming in from the, from the infested areas. Uh, one down south, I don't know if anybody's on, on from Southern Nevada. Uh, this is RIFA or Red Imported Fire Ant. Uh, that's this guy down here. If anybody's familiar with the Southeastern United States, you know, uh, exactly what we're talking about when we call them an invasive species, one we don't want to get, uh, uh, get established. We've done probably 20 eradications uh, over my tenure at the, the department here of, of uh, red imported fire ant in Southern Nevada. Uh, currently, these are different bait traps, mint jelly, spam. Uh, we currently are on to, to using uh, potato chips. That seems to be um, the best one. I threw this in, uh, this is one of the new invasive species. There are some mis misconcepts about it, um, that there's a lot, gonna be a lot of deaths from it, that it'll spread everywhere, uh, it won't, and it prefers honeybees all the time, it really doesn't. Honeybees become 
uh, more of a prey item toward the fall of the year when the colonies get large and stress for, for other food sources. Um, right now, it's a very limited distribution. It's only found in the very uh, northwestern part of Washington. Uh, in the United States, there's a few up in Canada too. Only 14 confirmed sightings in 2021, although I probably have had 30 or 40 phone calls during the summer of people telling me that they saw a Asian giant hornet. Uh, we do have a handout or a page on the website with some of the lookalikes. Um, they've destroyed three nests so far in, in uh, 2021. Uh, and I think there was one or two nests in, in 20. Um, but this is what I'm talking about. People think they're gonna go everywhere. Uh, this gray blue area right here is really not suitable for them. So they're not gonna do very well in this area. And you can kind of see that's most of Nevada. Maybe just this area actually is just the very top of Nevada. But big deal uh, in the East Coast. And you can see that's pretty red right up here. Um, in the Pacific Northwest for them to get going. Surprising uh, Alaska is, but this, this insect is fairly cold tolerant, but it likes more humid climates. Red palm weevil is another one. Uh, sorry, we wiped out the uh, scientific name there, but this one is one that is being a huge problem. It's an Asian insect, got introduced into the Middle East uh, in the Mediterranean area and is a huge problem there on their palm trees. We've been surveying for it for several years and haven't caught anything. California actually caught a couple. Um, you can see what they, the larvae uh, feed on the interior of the palm tree and kill it. Uh, <clears throat> this is a trap we use. We bait it with dates uh, and fer various pheromones. Uh, and then we, we pick them up every month. This is uh, part of our uh, wood destroying uh, pest uh, or uh, invasive wood destroying insects survey. We use these lingering traps that are a series of funnels. The insect flies along, hits it, drops down into the funnel. And then we pick these things up every two to, two to four weeks and sort them out. Uh, the Mediterranean pine engraver is a recent one. Um, came into California. Uh, spread very rapidly across the entire southwest of the United States uh, and, and as a, uh, can really uh, do a, a number on stressed Mediterranean pines. Uh, our native pines so far seem to be pretty good uh, from the data that we, we have right now. Emerald ash borer, a uh, big one, uh, probably the number one uh, in, the, in the U.S. now as far as, far as spreading. D-shaped holes in ash trees um, need to get a hold of me. Uh, let us know. Uh, if somebody had looked at these trees, say when, the, when this thing first came in, said, hey, what's killing those trees? Uh, let's figure it out. Uh, we may be able to have slowed it down. You can see how it's expanded all the way across here. And there's little single counties dots out here. Um, anyway, um, and how are these getting moved around? Well, uh, we look at these things. This is another one of that same genus on oak. Uh, it hasn't spread except in Southern California right now. Uh, another uh, one of the wood, wood uh, invasive wood species, uh, wood feeding species, Asian longhorn beetle. There's actually been some eradications done in Chicago and a couple other places uh, around the country. Uh, but you can see uh, this is a fairly large insect. We have some lookalikes of it too. But this is how things are getting, how these wood, uh, uh, exotic wood borers are getting spread around. It's simply firewood. Everywhere back on that map that you saw, you know, a single county, most often those are, are Camp, from campgrounds. And we have a big program right now. We're uh, finishing up some uh, uh, regulations uh, to prev help prevent uh, the movement of firewood from infested areas. 
Japanese beetle, another one uh, established, well established in the Eastern United States. We do have infestations uh, all around us right now, uh, in, uh, except Arizona, but Utah, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, and California all have active infestations. Uh, these are both a foliage pest, as you can see, and the larvae are a turf pest. How do they get moved around? Well, nursery stock, of course, is one, but actually these guys jump on the airplanes and, and fly across the country. And who flies across the country the most? Uh, uh, the companies like FedEx and UPS, um, DHL. They, and now they have to spend millions of dollars a year to try and keep beetles out of their airplanes uh, from getting on the West Coast. What do you do if you see something strange? Don't ignore it. Take a sample or a photo, uh, get it to us either in our Reno or uh, excuse me, Sparks office uh, and or our Las Vegas office. Uh, give us a call. If it's infested stock, don't unload it. Uh, if, if it's infested with something that needs to be uh, quarantined then the truck's quarantined and or set back, if you drop it on your property and it's infested, then that becomes, uh, and the material's infested, then your property's infested as far as we're concerned in our, our efforts to control it. Give us a call. Uh, go to the website um, and, and we can go from there. You can submit insect samples to us, um, both at all the offices and however you like. Um, basically photos, text, uh, photo, photographs through the text, text uh, my cell phone, uh, email me. Uh, we do. I do a lot of that now. Um, just a heads up: there's some new regulations going through, and there'll be fees for not only insect identifications but plant disease identifications coming down the pipe. And this is one of the fun parts. I get to go out and sit around the light at night and look for invasive moths and and other insects. So that's that's it. Um, quick quick tour of our invasive species uh, survey program.